Now, as gunshots echo across the windswept, snow-covered reaches of the wild northwest, Quaker Puff Wheat and Quaker Puff Rice, the breakfast cereal shot from guns, present the challenge of the Yukon. It's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the Northwest, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police in his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. On King, on your hunting. Gold, gold discovered in a Yukon. A stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches. Back to the days of the gold rush. With Quaker Puff Wheat and Quaker Puff Rice bringing you the adventures of Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, Yukon King, as they meet the challenge of the Yukon. Say, the owl is a wise old bird, and here's my idea of someone who's plenty smart, too. It's the fellow or girl who eats a breakfast of Quaker puffed rice or Quaker puffed wheat with milk or cream and fruit. These king-size, ready-to-serve premium grains of rice or wheat are shot from guns. Yes, actually exploded up to eight times normal size to make them bigger and better tasting. No fooling. Wheat or rice shot from guns is so crisp and tender, it melts in your mouth. Shot through and through with bang-up nut-like flavor, too. And it's good for you. So tomorrow morning, be smart. Enjoy this breakfast treat. Quaker puff rice or Quaker puff wheat. Ann Dewey, whose father was the general manager of the Yukon Trading Company in Dawson, ordered a dog team harnessed one winter morning and drove south along the Yukon. After a five-mile run, she started to turn back. But just as the team was headed for town once more, a wolf streaked across the trail. The dogs jumped forward, and Ann, who was riding the runners of the sled, was thrown off. I'll know better than to take out a green team again. Uh, oh, oh, my ankle, it must be sprained. Oh, this is serious. Oh, thank goodness, a traveler heading for town. Hello there. Oh, 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 no. A girl. How do you do? Hello. What's the matter? My dogs ran away and I've, I've sprained my ankle. Oh, I'm sorry, miss. I'll get you on my sled. You're heading for Dawson, aren't you? That's right. How far is it? About five miles. Good. Just put your arm around my neck. Like this? Like that. Now then, we'll... Oh. What's the matter? I'm not that heavy. No, it's only... That's nothing. Is something wrong with your arm? Well, I... I did have a little accident on the trail, but... If we change around like this and I use my left arm, yeah, we'll manage fine. <sighs> That's more like it. <laughs> you sure don't weigh much. That's why Dad doesn't like me to go out in weather like this. He says I need a wind anchor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how's that? It's a little bumpy. What am I sitting on? A tent and a sleeping bag. You'd better tie me down to the sled. <laughs> you won't fall off. We'll take it easy. Hush, Polly! The young traveler took Anne home. And that evening, when John Dewey walked into his living room, he found him talking with his daughter. Uh, well, uh, good evening. Dad, this is Ross Bartlett. Oh, how do you do? Good evening, sir. See, what's that bandage on your ankle, Anne? Well, what's wrong? It's a sprain. I fell off my sled, the team ran away, and Ross came to my rescue. Wasn't it romantic? <clears throat> I'll probably marry him. Oh, that'd be a fine way to treat a man after he's done you a favor. <laughs> Very well, then. <laughs> Perhaps you can return the favor. Uh, really, Miss Dewey, you I... promised to call me Anne. <laughs> I, I mean Anne. I make him call me Anne because it makes him blush. Oh, <laughs> uh, Mr. Dewey, I, I don't want you to think. I, I mean... Why shouldn't uh... my father think? He's used to it. Uh, you'd better give up, young fella, and let her speak her piece. Well, go to it, Annie. What's on your mind? Well, 
The company owns a big tract of timberland at Grand Point, doesn't it? Yes. And you believe you're going to have a building boom in the spring? No doubt about that. 20,000 in town now. New people coming in all the time. And nowhere near enough cabins for them. Yes, of course we're going to have a boom. Then why doesn't the company have their timber cut this winter so they can sell it in the spring? <laughs> well, you're a little late with your suggestion. I've already made arrangements to have it done. Oh, I'm sorry, Ross. It was a good idea. <laughs> That's all right. Maybe I can get a job with a man who has the contract. Uh, what's all this about? Ross didn't come up here to prospect for gold, Dad. His business is lumber. Oh, that's so? Where are you from? Michigan. My father was a lumberman before me. Well, no reason why you shouldn't make good at it up here. Plenty of timber in the Yukon, and if this gold rush keeps up, there'll be plenty of need for it. I'll look around, sir. I was hoping you could work for Dad. Well, maybe he can. But you've already made arrangements. All preliminary arrangements. The contract isn't let. I've posted a notice and asked for bids. Deadline's tomorrow. Tomorrow? Then there's still time. Tomorrow at 6 o'clock. About uh, 24 hours from now. During that time, you should take a look at the point, boy. It's 20 miles up the river. There's no way you can make an estimate without looking it over. That's true, sir. Have you received any bids so far, Dad? Just one. From whom? Uh, Dan Foley. Dan Foley? Oh, Ross, I hate that man. He's the worst bully in town. You must beat him out. Twenty miles. If you start right now, you can get back by six o'clock tomorrow night. Well, my team's come all the way from Skagway. Dad can get you some fresh dogs, can't you, Dad? Well, I don't see why not. Great. Let's go, Mr. Dewey. Come along. John Dewey arranged for the loan of a team from Nugget Mike. And as the dogs were being harnessed, he gave Ross all the information he needed concerning the company's land at Grand Point. Slim Rafferty, one of Dan Foley's men, watched from across the street. And when the young lumberman drove off, he questioned Mike and then reported to Dan in the Silver Slipper Cafe. Hey, Dan. Yeah? You want that logging contract in Dewey, don't you? Want it? I'll get it. Nobody's bidding against me. They know better. Your bid's pretty high, isn't it? Plenty high. What difference does that make? Somebody's trying to cut you out. What do you mean? Just what I said. There's a young guy driving up to Grand Point tonight to take a look at the land. I saw him talking with Dewey. You saw it? Yeah, I couldn't hear what they were saying. But they were at Nugget Mike's bar on a team. And after the young guy left, I had a talk with Mike. He's going to bid against you. No, he isn't. Now, what's going to stop him? You are. Well, how can I? He's got to be back here by 6 o'clock tomorrow night, doesn't he? Sure, that's the deadline. See that he doesn't make it. What? You don't want I to... said see that he doesn't make it. You can understand English, can't you? Okay, boss. Okay. The following afternoon, Sergeant Preston was driving north on the Yukon Trail in the direction of Dawson. King was working in harness over the hard-packed trail and setting a six-mile-an-hour pace. As they rounded a bend in the trail, he saw a traveler ahead. A traveler on foot and staggering from side to side. I see him, boy. Even as the sergeant spoke, the man dropped to the ground. And as the team raced up to him, King didn't need the sergeant's command to halt. Hold on, hold on, hold on. It's almost done for, King. Right. Here, try to swallow some of this. I Don't can't. talk, swallow. <coughs> That's enough. Feel better? Uh, yeah. What happened? Well, I... I was driving along. I, I rounded a bend close to the bank. It was pretty high, like it is here. Somebody jumped down on top of me and cracked me over the head with the butt of a gun. That's all I remember. When I woke up, I was lying in the snow at the side of the trail. My dogs were gone, so I started to walk. Have you been robbed? Uh, no. No, I have my wallet. Say... That's the uniform Pocky you're wearing. Sergeant Preston, Northwest Mounted Police. Can you describe the man who hit you? No. My name's Ross Bartlett, Sergeant. I've got an important business deal with John Dewey and Dawson. I have to be there by 6 o'clock. Can you take me? Can you get me there by 6? Oh, well, let's see. That's three hours. Closer to a four-hour run. But if time's important, King can make it, can't you, boy? It is important. I'll help you up. All right. Oh. What's the matter? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I busted some ribs about a month ago, and I, I guess they got cracked up again today. Easy does it. Yeah. Uh, Broken ribs. 
Dangerous to take chances with them. I don't like to travel too fast, Bartlett. Yeah, I've got to be in Dawson by 6 o'clock. That's all that matters. You might be laid up for a long time afterwards, though. Please, Sergeant. Well, we'll do our best. All right. Hunting! On, you husky! At five minutes of six, Anne let Dan Foley into the Dewey home and showed him into the living room where her father was waiting. Hello, John. Ready to give me that contract? Why, it's only five minutes of six. <laughs> What's five minutes between friends? You aren't expecting any other bids, are you? Yes, he is. Is that so? There. There he is now, Dad. I'll let him in. Hello, Anne. You're just in time. Thanks a lot, Sergeant. I'll be back for you as soon as I report in. Okay. How does it happen you're riding with Sergeant Preston? I'll tell you about that later. In here. Good evening, Mr. Dewey. It isn't six yet, is it? Uh, one minute, two. Well, here's my bid. If you have an envelope, I'll seal it. Oh, no need for that. Hand it over. Now, wait a minute, dear. Are you going to consider this Tenderfoot's bid? Why shouldn't he? Ross has enough money to handle the contract, and he knows his business. Yeah? Your estimate seems fair enough, Ross. Now I'll take a look at yours, Dan. Let's see. Well, you figured on making a lot, didn't you? The contract is yours, Ross. Good. Thanks, Mr. You're Dewey. making a big mistake if you give it to him. It'll cost me $5,000 less, yeah, Dan. Yeah, but you want your logs, don't you? I'm confident he'll do a good job. He may know all there is to know about lumbering, but he don't know anything about the Yukon. Takes a man to be the winner up here. He's a better man than you are, Dan. You think so, huh? I'll give him a chance to prove it. Dan walked across to the young lumberman and deliberately slapped his face. <coughs> oh! Why, you... Oh! Instinctively, oh. Ross's hands went up, but the sharp movement sent a stabbing pain through his right side. Uh, he clutched at the table for support. Maybe he didn't feel that first slab. Here's another. Oh, Ross, you can't let him get away with that. <laughs> can't he, though? Eh? Oh. Look at him hanging on the table there. He's scared green. Uh, and that's a man who's going to bring your logs down the river, eh? Yeah. Just wait till he gets a look at the Yukon breaking up. <laughs> You'll be calling on me to handle that contract yet, John. Mr. Bartlett, I've never been so mistaken about anyone in my life. Yeah. You... You have your contract. Now, please, please get out of here. We'll continue our story in just a moment. Say, here's a breakfast treat that can't be beat. I mean crisp, swell-tasting Quaker puffed rice or Quaker puffed wheat. The crisp, tender, ready-to-serve cereals shot from guns. Hey, what you going on? Let me in. Say, are you all right? You need any help? Help? Why, no. But say, fella, where are you going in that coonskin cap and buckskin coat? And man alive, what are you doing with that musket? Must be six feet long. Son, I heard shooting, and I come a run in. Well, who are you? Name's Boone. Daniel Boone. Daniel Boone? The great pioneer hunter and woodsman? Name's Daniel. Gee, I'll bet you're mighty handy with that rifle you're carrying. Ever heard any complaints? Oh, look, Daniel, that shooting you heard now is just me explaining about the keenest tasting breakfast ever. Oh. That's rice or wheat shot from guns. What? Huh? Sure. Nowadays, we load huge guns with choice, sun-ripened, premium grains of rice or wheat. And then these guns are exploded. Out come colossal, giant grains exploded up to eight times normal size. They're crispified, shot through and through with bang-up nut-like flavor, too. That's why Quaker puffed rice and Quaker puffed wheat are so good to eat. And I'll be horn swiggled. And for breakfast, lunch, or supper, all you do is pour out a bowl full right from the package, add milk or cream, and top with your favorite fruit. That's for me. And what's more, Quaker puffed rice and Quaker puffed wheat are nourishing. They're good for you. They furnish added health values of restored natural grain amounts of vitamin B1, niacin, and iron. Uh, look, son, uh, where do I get me a couple of packages of this here rice and wheat shot from guns? And oh, you get them at the nearest grocery store. And fellas and girls, here's a tip for you, too. Delicious Quaker puffed rice and Quaker puffed wheat is never sold in bags or bulk. 
To get the original crisp, fresh rice or wheat shot from guns, always look for the big red and blue package with the smiling Quaker man on the front. Now to continue our story. When Dan Foley slapped Ross Bartlett's face, it was physically impossible for the young lumberman to retaliate. But Ann Dewey thought his reluctance was due to cowardice. Ross left the house, and Sergeant Preston found him walking down Front Street toward the hospital. Okay. Hold your Ross, I asked you to wait at the house. Uh, I, I, I finished my business. I... I'm not welcome there anymore. Steady, I got you. The sergeant helped Ross onto the sled and then drove him to the hospital. There, his broken ribs were taped, and he was put to bed under a sedative. It was not until the next morning that the sergeant heard the details of his encounter with Dan Foley. So there you have it, sergeant. The contract's mine, but I have to prove that Dan is wrong about me. Well, that's simple enough. Let me go to John Dewey and tell him about your broken ribs. No. You can't prove that you're not yellow with words, sergeant. They say it'll take a man to bring those logs down from Grand Point. Well, I'm going to do the job. That'll be my answer. You're disappointed in the way Ann took it, aren't you? I wouldn't say that. You don't have to. I said it. And I can understand how you might want to prove yourself to her. But John Dewey has a right to know the truth. He has a right to know he hasn't made any mistake in hiring you. You can see that, can't you? I can see that, but he'll tell Ann. No, he won't. He'll understand, too. Well, I don't... Now, uh, how about a crew? I'll have to round one up. You can't leave your bed. I'll take care of it for you. Will you, Sergeant? Of course. Then you can go to work as soon as you get out of here. The Sergeant had a talk with John Dewey that same morning. When he had finished... You know, Sergeant, uh, something told me there was a good explanation for the way he acted. I haven't been worried at all. And Anne? Well, she likes him. She likes him a lot. And that had a lot to do with her reaction. She... Wanted so much to be proud of him. Ross doesn't want you to tell her, not yet. Naturally. You understand how he feels? Well, I'm not so old that I can't put myself in his place. Yes, all right, Sergeant. I'll keep the secret as long as Ross wants me to. It was nearly a week before Ross was ready to leave the hospital. And during that time, Sergeant Preston hired a crew and bought all the supplies his camp would need. The day came when Ross said goodbye to the sergeant in front of the Northwest Mounted Headquarters. Once again, thank you, sergeant. Goodbye and good luck. I'll see you in the spring. Ready, boys? Let's go. March! A month later, John Dewey was forced to make a trip to one of the company's trading posts, and Anne was left alone in Dawson. One night, she heard someone shouting outside the house... And then there was a knock at the door. Who can that be? Open the door, Annie. We've got news for you. Dan Foley. Oh, hello, Annie. Ross will be coming back to Dawson in a day or two. What for? To buy some new supplies. His storehouse is going to burn down tonight. His storehouse? His storehouse and maybe his whole camp. Of course, nothing will happen to him. I'll bet he can run plenty fast. He'll run all the way back here. Get out of here. <laughs> all right, all right. Sergeant. Sergeant Preston, I must tell him. Dan said it was going to happen tonight. Five minutes later, Ann was at headquarters. And five minutes after that, Sergeant Preston harnessed his team and drove out of Dawson. You've got to make it fast, King. All right. Run, King. Run, you have to. King realized the need for speed from his master's voice, and he urged the team on to its best performance. The sled flew over the hard-packed trails, and the glistening miles slipped by. The 20 miles were covered in little more than three hours, and as the point and the camp were sighted, King barked a warning to his master. What is it, boy? There were no lights in the clearing, but the outlines of all the cabins could be seen clearly under the aurora. Then, from the window of one of the cabins, the largest, the sergeant saw a single tongue of flame. Fire! Run, King! Wake up, Ross! Bill! Fire! The sergeant roused the camp with his shouts. By the time he had stopped, the sled near the storage cabin... Oh, hold on, hold on! All the men had poured out of their sleeping quarters. Quickly, the sergeant organized them into firefighting teams. The blaze was still confined to one corner of the cabin. 
And in 15 minutes, they had it under control. Sergeant Ross and Bill Carney watched the men stamping out the last of the embers. We've only lost a few bags of flour and some canned goods, Ross. Yeah, the men worked right. well. Thanks to you, Sergeant. How did you happen to be around here? A good friend of yours and Dawson warned me that something like this might happen tonight. A good friend? I don't have any friends in Dawson. Oh, yes, you do, Ross. Even if she doesn't think she's your friend. Anne? Yes. But how did she know? Through Dan Foley. It's a good thing he likes to brag. Dan Foley was responsible for this. I'm sure of it, Ross, even though I probably won't be able to prove it. But King can pick up the trail of the man and men who started this fire, and we'll catch them. We may be able to make them talk. Could it have been Indians? That's what Dan would like to have us think. I'll find out. And when you do catch them? They'll go to jail. If they're white men and Dan hired them, they won't involve him. No, I'm afraid not. You're looking well, Ross. Never felt better, Sergeant. And it's about time you went back to Dawson. To Dawson? It's time for your showdown with Dan. That's a good idea. Yeah. This fire. Things like that will be happening all winter if I don't do something about it. They all think I'm yellow in Dawson. It won't cost Dan much to hire troublemakers. Of course, I'm not advising any methods. But my job right now is to follow a trail. I won't be starting back for town until I reach the end of it. In other words, I'm on my own. I'm with you, boss. Get a team harness, Bill. We're leaving right away. The cafes in Dawson kept open all night long. And at four o'clock in the morning, Dan Foley was still celebrating. Slim Rafferty was standing by his side at the bar. Have your fun while you can, boys. Won't be long before I put you to work. Hey, Dan, look who just walked in. Ross Bartlett. Yeah, I'm expecting him. All right, quiet, everybody. Quiet. Well, what are you doing here, sonny boy? Don't you know this is my territory? You hired someone to fire my camp tonight. Ah, uh, don't get reckless, mister. I wouldn't say things like that if I was you. He's saying it and he means Keep it. Keep out of this, Bill. There wasn't much damage, Foley. But the next time you try anything like that, I'll knock your block off. Hey, somebody's been feeding him raw meat, yeah. boy. Yeah. <laughs> now listen, Bartlett. Once I called you yellow, and that still goes... Once I slapped your face. And now I'm going to do it again. Try it. I've got the rest of you covered. Don't make a move. Oh, wait a minute. Come on, Dan. Don't play here. What are you waiting for? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> here we go. <laughs> the fight was on. Dan outweighed Ross by at least 20 pounds, but the younger man was faster. At first, he was kept on the defensive, avoiding Dan's bear-like rushes. But at last, he found an opening. He drove a right to his opponent's jaw that stopped Dan for a moment. Dan rushed once more. Now Ross refused to give ground. Bobbing and weaving, he drove piston-like rights and lefts to Dan's midsection. Dan dropped his guard, and Ross's left connected with his jaw. The blow knocked him back against the table, and it crashed beneath his weight. Close to panic, he scrambled to his feet and ducked behind another table. What's the matter with you guys? Come on, give me a hand. Oh, they admit he's too much for you. I'll take that gun, Carney. And why come you... on, come on, get him. Half a dozen of Dan's men closed in on Ross and Bill. They fought bravely and well with their backs to the bar, but it was only a question of time before the odds would prove too much for them. Then Ross heard a welcome cry from the doorway. All right, bring it up. It was Sergeant Preston. Dan's men paid no attention to his command. So without any hesitation, the sergeant forced his way through the watching crowd and waded into the tangle around the bar. He fought his way through to Ross and Bill's side. And with his help, the tide of battle turned. Slim Rafferty reached for his knife, but King was in the fight too. And when he saw the flashing blade, he leaped at Slim and knocked him to the floor. Ross was proving his courage against Dan. One of Dan's terrific blows had cut his cheek, but Ross was smiling. So I'm yelling, Dan. I'm yelling. Oh. How about that? Oh. And that? Oh. And enough? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't, don't, don't. Who's yelling now? I am, I am. Stop it, stop it. Don't hit me anymore. Dan dropped to his knees and covered his face with his arms. When the other members of his gang saw him, they were ready to call it quits as well. You won't get me! But Slim tried to make a break for the door. King barred his way. Come here, you Oh, let go! Lightning fast, the sergeant snapped a pair of handcuffs on his wrists. Another pair went on Dan's. And then... Take these off. It was Bartlett who started the fight. Was it, Ross? No, wait a minute. Dan, what are you doing here? I've been watching for the sergeant to come back. Instead, I saw you and Bill come in here. I followed you. You've been standing over there by the door. Sergeant, I, 
I'd like to say that Ross had a great deal of provocation. That Dan landed the first blow. I see. Well, uh, Ross will still have to appear before the judge in the morning, and I should take him to jail tonight. Okay, Sergeant. Unless, of course, I can find some reputable citizen who will answer for his appearance. Am I a reputable citizen? Indeed you are. Then couldn't I? It's a good suggestion. I'll release him into your custody. Thank you, Sergeant. Ross, I... I've been so wrong. I still don't understand, but... Please, won't you take me home? I sure will, Ann. Come on. So long, Sergeant. What's the... What's the charge against me? Disturbing the peace? For these others, yes. But not for you, Dan. It was just a fight. Scotty Malone is in jail. Huh? I picked him up on the inland trail, heading back from the point. What of it? He set fire to Butler's cabin. What's that got to do with me? Oh, now, how do you happen to know he did that? Well, all all this talk, everything that's been said... All this talk includes Scotty's confession. Then you hired him, and you'll go to jail with him. People are no longer afraid of you, and there'll be ample evidence to convict you. This case is closed. In just a moment, Sergeant Preston will give you a preview of Friday's adventure. Fellas and girls, whether you're in the great rugged Yukon or here at home, you need plenty of food energy. Yes, and if you were to ask Sergeant Preston, you can bet he'd agree that a good breakfast is a mighty important source of food energy. So here's a tip. See to it that you eat a nourishing He-Man's breakfast. You'll want to include a big heaping bowlful of Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice with milk or cream and fruit. Try it. Wheat or rice shot from guns is crisp, tender, delicious. What's more, it furnishes added food values of restored natural grain amounts of vitamin B1, niacin, and iron. Tomorrow, ask for Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice in the famous big red and blue Quaker package. Listen Friday when Sergeant Preston and Yukon King meet the challenge of the Yukon in the case of... A boy and his dog. When I gave little Bobby Small a puppy, I didn't imagine that a few months later that same pup would play an important part in a case that nearly cost Bobby and me our lives. Be sure to hear this exciting adventure Friday. These radio dramas, a feature of the challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, are created and produced by George W. Trendle, directed by Fred Flowerday, and supervised by Charles D. Livingston. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. They are brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at the same time by Quaker Puffed Wheat and Quaker Puffed Rice, the breakfast cereal shot from guns. Don't miss this sensational offer for all dog owners. The famous Kennel Bar Dog Feeding Bowl compares with bowls up to $3.50 value. It's yours for just $1 and four kennel ration labels. It's the new improved method for feeding dogs. A heavy gauge plastic bowl, 15 inches long. Serves water and food separately. Won't tip over and it's easy to clean. Get your Kennel Bar Dog Feeding Bowl today. Send one dollar and four kennel ration labels to Kennel Ration, Chicago, 77. This is J. Michael wishing you goodbye, good luck, and good health from Quaker Puffed Wheat and Quaker Puffed Rice. So long.